Thank you. Our gospel lesson is found in the gospel according to John, the sixth chapter. I'll begin reading in verse number 56. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, and the flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you, no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. May God bless the reading and hearing of this word. May we hear in it a word that is to us and for us. Let me ask you to pray. Oh Lord, bring this word to life, enable us to understand the word which is spoken to us. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you. Amen. I am still trying to follow Jesus. Imperfectly, Yes. Drastically and perfectly, you might be surprised. But after all these years, I'm still trying to follow Jesus. I'm still trying to see the divine presence in everyone I meet. I'm still trying to see it even when it is covered up by grumpiness, pain, or disappointment in life. I'm still trying to see it in the face in the mirror, even when it is covered up by grumpiness or pain or disappointment. I'm still trying to forgive those who have trespassed against me. That is always a hard one, isn't it? Even as I seek to be forgiven for my own trespasses. I'm still trying to choose the path of peace even when other paths seem easier and more inviting. I'm still trying to believe that God is at work in this world even when I have no idea where or how it's going on. I'm still trying to allow the appropriate room for anger at the injustices levied against the vulnerable children of this world, still trying to call right right and wrong wrong as it exists in the world and in my own conduct. I'm still trying to follow Jesus. Do I stumble? Yes. Do I sometimes ungracefully with arms flailing about just fall flat on my face? Yeah, sometimes I do. But I'm still trying to follow Jesus. Uh, Those thoughts uh, were inspired in me from someone much more articulate than I, who I quote from time to time, Maya Angelou, 
um, as she was being interviewed after receiving the, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, uh, she said that she's always surprised when someone uh, approaches her and says that they are a Christian. And she, with a twinkle in her eyes and a, a bit of a chuckle, would say, Really? You've already got it? <laughs> I'm still trying. I'm still trying to be kind and fair and generous and respectful to everyone I meet, but I'm still working at it. She speaks for many of us. Today's gospel lesson, in it we find ourselves at the end of a long discourse in John's gospel, circling around Jesus as the bread of life. It began with Jesus famously uh, feeding the 5,000 with meager resources and then it moves from there into the heightened interest that people had in Jesus because of, of that uh, miracle. And, and then it moves to Jesus being a bit skeptical of what their devotion was really about. Then it moves to Jesus making some bold statements and some bold claims about who he was. And woven into all of it is this language of eating the flesh of Jesus and drinking his blood. Now, we contemporary Christians, we have a reference point. And our minds probably go to a very uh, you know, easy image of a nicely set up table for the service of communion. But we have to wonder and be sympathetic to the original hearers who heard these words and they might have just said, yuck. <laughs> Today we find ourselves at the end of that discourse. And it's been going on for weeks in the lectionary cycle. And coming to this end, some people might say, thankfully so. Especially during the summer when we don't always have children's church. Enough of the talk of eating flesh and drinking blood. What we discover as we come to the conclusion of this narrative is that the people's approach to Jesus has shifted. It began with adulation and wonder, but then it, it shifts to frustration and then to skepticism about these claims that Jesus is making about himself. And finally, this passage brings us to some of the most poignant words in all of the New Testament. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. I wonder how Jesus felt about that. I wonder if he felt the pain of lost friendships. I wonder if he saw the dwindling number of his followers and was visited by self-doubt. If we allow Jesus to be the human being made of flesh and blood, which John talks so much about, surely he must have felt these things. Do you remember Crocodile Dundee? Great movie. Well, great is probably a stretch. All right? The Sound of Music was a great movie. All right? Schindler's List was a great movie. Crocodile Dundee was some lighthearted entertainment, and sometimes that's just what we need. Well, there's a scene where Crocodile Dundee, whose name was Mitch, was talking to the woman who would become the romantic interest uh, of his in the movie, and she's describing to him another woman whose life had been enhanced and, and made better through therapy. Now, Mick was an outdoorsman, and so he didn't quite understand uh, how counseling can help people through tough times and why people would seek out a professional for, for help. And so in his lack of understanding, he said, doesn't she have any mates? And this led to a conversation about friendship and what friendship means and what it meant to Mick with his friends, what they did for him and what he did for them. And so I wonder if in this moment, Jesus being made of flesh and blood, I wonder if his heart ached. As his friends, as his mates deserted him. And so this passage left me wondering about Jesus' humanity as his relationships with his followers changed. Did he feel abandoned? 
I wonder if he went away by himself so that he could grieve, shed some tears. But alas, just as I was about to embrace the darkness of this passage and drag you into that black hole with me, the Spirit spoke to me. Well, and if it wasn't the Spirit, it was some voice that said, take another look. Perhaps there's some good news in all of this for us. Poignant and even painful as these words may be, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. They are not the last word. The last words are full of hope. The last words are full of possibility. Jesus turned to the few who remained, and I mean the few. Do you want to go away as well? I, for one, don't believe that this, there was anything rhetorical in the way that Jesus asked the question. I, for one, believe that there might have been angst and doubt and a trembling in his voice. And then it was Simon Peter who spoke first. He always spoke first, but he often spoke wrongly. But in this moment, Simon Peter finds some high ground. Lord, to whom do we go? For we have come to believe in you, and that you have the words of life. For illustration purposes, let me go to one more movie. <laughs> I promise it's the last one. Another great movie, Runaway Bride, with Richard Gere and Julia Roberts. Okay, it wasn't great either. <laughs> but it entertained me. Your pastor enjoys a romantic comedy every now and then with some white wine. Don't judge, just deal with it. Julia Roberts was the runaway bride, and on several occasions involving several different men, she literally ran away from the altar at the last moment because she would panic. This had happened and been videoed enough times that she had become not so much famous but notorious. And Richard Gere was a reporter who was charged with doing a story about the, the runaway bride. Her problem was that she was seeking perfection. A perfect husband, a perfect relationship in the midst of a perfect life. And she expected the perfect wedding, but it all had to begin with the perfect proposal. And so and there's a scene where she's telling Richard Gere about the many grand and romantic uh, proposals that she had received. One of her persons proposed to her on the giant scoreboard on the screen of a Baltimore Orioles game. To that, Richard Gere's character said this about marriage proposals. Maybe it's just me, but if you have to dress it up like that, it just doesn't ring true. I think the most anybody can honestly say is that I guarantee there will be tough times. I guarantee at some point one or both of us is going to want to walk away from this thing. But I know that if I don't ask you to be mine, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. Because in my heart, you are the only one for me. To that, Julia Roberts' character responded, that sounds good, but it would be better on a scoreboard. <laughs> in true Hollywood fashion, she left <laughs> her fiance and rode off into the sunset with Richard Gere. Be that as it may, and acknowledging that romantic comedies are insufficient means to describe the joys and challenges of Christian discipleship, it opens the door that I wanted opened to say this. The best we can honestly say about following Jesus and in the way of Jesus in these days and times the best we can say about following Jesus and not the way of Christian nationalism, not the way of taking the name and the image of Jesus and grotesquely disfiguring that image for political purposes, not the way on 
of throwing fuel on the, words, the world's fires by claiming our truth is the only truth. But the best we can honestly say about following Jesus and in the way of Jesus is that there will be tough times. There will be times when we are disappointed in the church. There will be times when we will be disappointed in one another. There will be times when in our failures to follow, we will be disappointed in ourselves. You don't believe me? <laughs> Have you heard the claims that we make every Sunday before we even start to worship? They're bold claims, folks. I start off and I say, we believe that all people are God's people and that every child is holy and that every person is a part of the sacred family. Well, easy enough. But then you folks chime in. <laughs> and then you say, we believe that God's love embraces all and that to exclude any person would be contrary to the message of Jesus. All right then. I come back with this. We proclaim that this community of faith will strive, get this, to be as open as the radical realm of God and as liberating as the love of Christ. And then, so we journey into our hopeful future with joy pledging to offer each other welcome, compassion, and care. What wonderful goals that we are going to fail at some times. But we must then rise and try again to be who we claim to be and who we know God wants us to be. There will be times when offering the voice we need to offer will require more courage than we think we can muster. There will be times when we will fail so miserably or become so stuck in our own doubts and confusion that it would be easier just to sit down and to give up and to shut up and to relinquish our opportunities to be light and love in this world which is starving itself to death for light and for love. We must know like Simon Peter and those few disciples which remained knew that if we choose to stay, God's grace can empower us to walk on this path. We must know that. We must believe that there is higher ground to be found and that the way of Jesus and the path of profound love and just peace will lead us to that high ground on which we as a human family will one day stand. I thought about my father as I wrote this sermon. I thought of him because the first book and the only book that he ever insisted that I read was The Cost of Discipleship, by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer, a German during Hitler's rule, didn't just write about discipleship. He spoke out and against the Nazi atrocities and moreover, spoke out against the church's silence and complacency about it. And he paid the price for it. My, my father's insistence that I read it was his way of saying, son, <laughs> you better know what you're getting into. At his passing, I was in no condition to try to preach his funeral service, but I want to share with you some of the words I wrote for another pastor to read. They describe a man who I knew to be imperfect, but to have followed Jesus and the way of Jesus as best he knew how. This is what I wrote. My father showed up. That is the legacy of his life. His was not a complicated life, nor did he leave behind complicated memories. For those he loved and those who depended upon him, he showed up. He showed up all the time, every time, and on time. 
Many of you would know that my father took care of my mother over a number of years of declining health. Few people know, however, the depth of devotion or sacrifices to his own health and well-being that he made. Few people know that because few people know that because he never complained. Despite the toll that caretaking took on him, I would learn that he never ever considered it a burden. Although there were fewer demands placed upon him in the four years after my mother's death, there was always more than a hint of loneliness in his speaking and movement in his life without her. A little of the light went out after her passing. No one can understand his life without understanding that Richard loved Marianne. He was a man of faith, real faith. After his diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, Dad told me that he didn't know what was on the other side, but he wasn't afraid. He wasn't one to speak with certitude or religious platitudes. He was simply ready to move into the greatest of unknowns and to trust himself to the source of love from which he had come. My father lived in peace. He took his last breath in peace. My father walked in the way of Jesus as best he knew how, and in my estimation, he did better than most. Now, because he was my father, I've got a little bit of my dad's bigger than your dad going on here. <laughs> I probably made him out to be more of a hero than he would have thought of himself to be. But the thing is, none of us have to be heroes. We just have to keep walking. Keep showing up for one another and for those who depend upon us. One foot in front of the other. Dusting ourselves off when we fall and growing each time we do fall. Wallowing in the mud of guilt and shame isn't necessary nor helpful. Let us just learn and grow when we fall. And stand back up and keep walking. In this sometimes crazy and chaotic, chaotic world, we're still trying to follow Jesus. Imperfectly, yes drastically and perfectly sometimes. But after all these years, we're still trying to follow Jesus. So Lord, lead us to that higher ground. We're pressing on the upward way. New heights we're gaining every day. Still praying as we onward, are onward bound, Lord, plant our feet on higher ground. Our hearts have no de desire to stay where doubts arise and fear dismays. Though some may dwell where these abound, our prayer, our aim is higher ground. We want to scale the utmost heights and catch a glimpse of glory bright. But still we pray till heaven we found. Lord, lead us on to higher ground. Lord, lift us up and let us stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than we have found, Lord, plant our feet on higher ground. And with God's grace to guide us, to pick us up and to dust us off when we fail. Let us keep trying to follow Jesus. Amen.